Okay, so we'll continue on, on from where we left off with Kiavot. We're almost at the end of Perek Bet. Some very important Mishnayot about how we should maximize our time, how we should pray, how we should learn. It's not just about learning and praying, but how to go about it. Time is precious. There's only so much that we can accomplish in life. So obviously it's important that we have our priorities straight and that we realize how significant our actions are. So what we've been doing recently is going through the advice, important advice that the Talmudim or Yohanan ben Zakai, the students of Yohanan ben Zakai, were advising not only their generation but future generations as well, things to focus on. There's a lot of good advice, but Kavod is full of advice. So we're dealing with a certain focus, focus on perhaps a few items, but those items, those details, are extreme, of extreme importance and are applicable and relevant in, at all times in every generation. For those who are learned and for those who are not as learned, it makes no difference. This is meant for everyone. So we're holding here with the advice of Rabbi Shimon and Rabbi Azar. There were five students. Each one said three important ideas. Each one communicated an idea that was very much in line with his character with his personality. Nonetheless, it was something that, of course, everybody agrees upon. But they were suggested by that particular student because of either his personal experience as well, making certain observations during his time, and, of course, in conjunction with how he felt about certain things. And that, of course, how a person feels stems from his personality, his character. Uh, those students were very special in some particular midah, some particular characteristic which stood out that they were very strong in. And because of that, they, they emphasized certain ideas. Rabbi Shimon tells us, Remember, this is the Rabbi Shimon who was called Yerechet. He was a God-fearing person. God-fearing meaning that he was extra careful. They're all God-fearing. All these rabbis were God-fearing. But he was Yerechet. He had this title, meaning that he was known to be extra careful from sin. He did not want to make any mistakes. So he was extra cautious. So he is telling us to be cautious with what? With Kriyat Shema and Tfilah. He's not telling us about the rest of the Torah. Obviously, we need to be careful with mitzvot and avirot and so forth. But here he's, telling, he's calling attention to two things that even observant religious Jews may not be so careful with. And this, these are so important, Barim Shondim Bero Moshe things that are very, very highly regarded that people underestimate their koach. And that is the reading of the Shema every day, whether it's the Shema in the morning, and whether it's the Shema later on in, at night, or the Shema before you go to sleep. But especially what he has in mind here is the Kriyat Shema in Shaharit. And Tefillah, when he says Tefillah, it's not just prayer in general, it's Tefillah Ha'amidah, which is a very, very unique prayer because of the many requests, the many bakashot that we have towards Hashem. Besides the praising of Hashem, besides the giving thanks to Hashem, which is all part of the Amidah, pretty much in the middle there's a whole bunch of basic requests that cover almost every aspect of our life. So he tells us to be very careful with them. Why? It's not only a matter of being careful in the timing, as some of the commentaries tell us, that be careful that you don't miss the time. Time is, is crucial that these Tefillot, be said in the proper time, and it's not only a matter of kavana that we have the proper kavana that we actually understand the words that we say, that we take them seriously. What he's really saying is, pay attention to the words that you're saying, because these words do not only have an impact on you as you say them, tefillah has an impact on us. Kriyat Shema is kabbalat or machut it's the acceptance of the yoke of heaven. If we realize what we're saying, it's very, very stimulating. It does a lot. In an indirect way, perhaps, we don't see it right away. So not only will they have a tremendous impact on us, if we say them right, they obviously can make a tremendous big difference, Bashamai. People don't realize it, how powerful prayer is. Just pay attention to these two. Kriyat Shema and Tefillah is very, very powerful. Kriyat Shema is the Shema Israel, is the Emunah, the Yehud, believing that Hashem is one, the acceptance of the Yoga of Heaven, the acceptance of Torah and Mitzvot. Very powerful words that if one understands them and he means them, of course, 
impact him, strengthen him. And of course, if, if words are said properly, if the, if the prayer is taken seriously, then it can have a tremendous effect. Bashamayim too, they will listen to us. If a person doesn't take the word seriously, then they don't listen to him. They're completely ignored. A person can pray all day long, but if he's not saying anything that he really means, that he really cares about, them, it's just like a, like a tukey, like a parrot, who's you know, saying, well, what, what, what significance does it have? So he tells us to, to, to be careful. Now, how to be careful? One way to be careful is something that we don't even realize. It's not just a matter of focus and concentration. There's a danger. There's a danger of shatamit palel al-ta'ast filatcha keva. That when you pray, be careful not to make your prayer something rudimentary, something ordinary, something of a routine. Keva means something that is fixed. When something that, something that is fixed is actually good. Fix, in fixation means consistency too. We do this every day. Beautiful. We give you a lot of credit for being kavua. People have a makom kavu in the Beit HaKnesset, a seat where they sit, that's very, very special. They're able to focus better. That's their seat, that's where they always pray. They're attached to that corner. The significant, as much as possible, one should sit where he always sits. As much as possible, within a few seats if possible. So kviut, which means fixation or consistency, usually is a good idea. Here it's not. Because here the kviut that we're talking about is something that is redundant, something that is routine, shigrati, as you say in Hebrew, something that becomes a routine, that means you treat this as you eat cornflakes every day in the morning, big deal. One does not take this seriously if, he, if it becomes a routine in his life. So he tells us to be careful, don't make it a routine. Kevin, in this case, does not mean something that's consistent, because that's good, that it's consistent, it should be every day tefillah. But here, it should not be something that you do just like you do everything else. You go to work, you eat, you sleep. These are also things of kviyut, of routine, of a routine nature. Don't do that to your tefillah, because you know what your tefillah is all about. Prayer is about There should be a time to ask for mercy and to plead with Hashem. Remember, after all, how is Hashem described? With the following characteristics. He's compassionate, he's merciful, he's tolerant, and he's kind. And he relents. He lets go. He relents on the terrible decrees that may have been decreed upon us. In other words, there is a chance to make a difference through prayer. So he's revealing to us that prayer is something that is unfortunately underestimated. People don't take it as seriously. And that is why he's warning us. This is, this is an area that is so significant. It's haval. What a shame that people don't maximize it. They have to take advantage of those moments that they have during the day. And even if it's not a time of prayer, one can always open up a tehillim. One can always pray to Hashem with his own words. He doesn't even have to use the words of the siddur. The words of the siddur were just so people could express their innermost feelings about everything, about sickness, about parnasa, livelihood, about children. You know, sometimes people don't find the words. People are not as fluent in Hebrew or in any other language. So the Chachamim made us, did this a favor of putting together a siddur, an organized prayer book of what to say, when to say. But you can say it in your own words in any language that you want. Hashem hears and understands everything. So the idea is that behind the words, there should be sincerity, there should be rahamim v'tachanunim, that you're actually asking Hashem, earnest, in earnest, that He should be compassionate, that He should not allow me that to the attribute of justice to affect us in any way. Because unfortunately we all make mistakes, and sometimes we overlook something, and upstairs there's a system called midat haddin. It's a system that Hashem created that basically, you know, goes according to the law. <laughs> We don't want it to go according to the law, if it's against us, right? So we have to ask Hashem to make some adjustments, make some changes. Hashem says, I'll be glad to do it for you, depending, of course, on what it is. If you pray to me, if you ask me to intercede, it can happen. But when a person does not use this tool properly, then it has no effect whatsoever. I saw 
The Or Haim says as follows, in order for a prayer to be accepted, to be heard, and to have a good chance of being uh, effective, there are four basic conditions. Arba'at Naim. One is that it should be as though he com compares himself to Ani Hadufek Aladelet. Like a poor man who's begging, who's knocking on the door. In other words, the attitude behind the prayer, the approach, should be, number one, Ke'ani, like a poor man who's begging, who's pleading. Number one. Number two, that his prayer is Mimekora Rahamim. He's obviously not asking the angels. He's asking from the source of all mercy, from Kadosh Baruch Hu. He realizes who he's asking for. People make the mistake, they go to the Kebra of a tzaddik, and they ask the tzaddik, please, you're not allowed to do that. First of all, the tzaddik does not listen to you. He's not there anymore, unless it's his yard side, perhaps. When we go to the Kebet, to the grave of Tzaddikim, we're asking Hashem, Bishchut the Tzaddik that is over here, please have mercy on us. Right? Or that the prayer should be taken to the Kisei Kavod, to Hashem. But we don't pray to the Tzaddik, we don't ask of the Tzaddik a particular thing. He doesn't have the right, he doesn't have the ability. The Tzaddik, Zechut of the Tzaddik, I should say, the Zechuyot, can, can, can possibly make a difference. Certain tzaddikim had tremendous powers while they were alive and, and even after their death, the rabbis tells they have these powers. And some of them have unique powers for, for beracha, for having children, some for zivugim. So we have traditions of where to go, for what to go. So kivret tzaddikim is definitely something that one should, uh, you know, go to, not so much because of the tzaddik, but because of ourselves, when we go and pray, no matter where you pray, but especially in a, pray, in a place like that where a tzaddik is, perhaps our prayer will come more easily to us. Perhaps we, our prayers will be more powerful this for the tzaddik. So it's not so much the asking of the tzaddik directly, it's always asking from Hashem, Mekor HaRachamim. This for the tzaddik possibly. So that's the second condition. Asking from Mekor HaRachamim, we're asking from the source of mercy. Number three, pay attention to the time of tefillah. There's something called etratzon. Etratzon is a propitious time. There are some times that are more propitious than other. Day is better than night for certain things. Time of shachrit is time of shachrit. Mincha is mincha, right? They say mincha has even a higher level than shachrit because it's a, it's, it's, a diff, it's a very unique timing where people are always busy. And this guy stops doing what everybody's doing, whatever he's doing, and pray. So it's, it's even more unique more perhaps more powerful than Shachrit, where everybody wakes up anyway in the morning to go to work. So what's the big deal to go to pray? But to stop everything in the middle of the day or late afternoon, close to the evening to pray Mikhail, it has definitely certain powers, yeah. Wasn't it also because of the Zechut of Eliyahu and Yeah, no, yeah. That, that is exactly what happened. Eliyahu prayed during that time, the afternoon. So we learned from that, that that's when Hashem answered him. Obviously there's something to do with the, the timing of that prayer. But every, every prayer is powerful. But here we're talking about the timing. Timing is the main thing, is that if, the, if a certain prayer is done at a certain time, when that is correct for that prayer to be said, that is when it has the cross. So number three is the Zmanat Tefillah. Number four is that the Tefillah should be explicitly clear. It should be something that one understands clearly what he's saying, what he's asking for. And I'd like to add to that, that it should be something that is worthy of asking. Don't tell Hashem, Hashem, please make me win the lottery. $500 million now. It's the big, uh, it's the big one they call it, or whatever they call it, the, there's another the name for it. Super Bowl. The Super? Ball. Or, yeah, Bobo the Bobo. Super, yeah, it's because Whatever, it's, yeah. the, the Jumbo, whatever. Yeah. How do you know this is good for you? I mean, this is gonna drive you crazy, it's gonna ruin your life. It's always important to ask for the right things. Want to write things? A person is single, has to get married. You want to learn better, you want to be more devoted servant to Hashem. These are all spiritual requests which always go answered. The non-spiritual, the material requests, who says Hashem wants to give it to you? That is because it's good for you. I want that girl to marry her. Marry her. Who says she's good for you? She's not your soulmate. She's not necessarily the right one for you. That's why when it comes to prayer, one should pray more in general. Tefillat of Shema Kolenu is the only prayer in the Amidah where one can make any requests he wants. The other prayers are specific to either Refa'enu, health, you can have somebody in mind who's sick. Slah Lanu Avinu, about asking for, for, 
forgiveness, right? Barech aleno o barecheno, the blessing of rain, the blessing of parnasah, right? Each prayer is specific to some area. Shema Koreno is a general. You can have anything in mind. You can have refuah too. You can have zivugim. You can have uh, health. Anything you want, and you can be specific and even mention a name. But it has to be something that makes sense. It has to be, some, therefore, it's better to be general. I don't know which parnasa. You know which parnasa. Don't, this one. Let him convince him to hire me. But maybe this is not the one Hashem wants you to have. So sometimes it's just better not to be specific, to be general. Only Hashem knows what's good for us. There is a famous mashal by the Chafetz Chaim who says like this If we ask Hashem for something that is not good for us, and in the end Hashem grants it to us, and when we head upstairs, you know, we're gonna, we, we find out that it was terrible for us, we're going to blame Hashem. Why did you give it to us? And this, there's a mashal to a father who goes to the grocery man and tells the grocery man, listen, when my son comes home from school, he'll stop into your store, give him candies, and I'll pay for them later. He says, okay, no problem. There was one problem. The, can the, 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 the grocery man gave the child as many candies as he wanted. But what happened at the end, now forget about the big bill. The child got a stomachache from it. So when the man came to collect his, his dues, his debt, from the father, the father began to yell at him. Not only do, did you ruin his stomach, and you give him an upset stomach and endanger him, you, you have the, the chutzpah now to ask for the, for the money too, for all of that. And who would be right if they would go to a bed din? Their father, because every normal human being using common sense knows you give a child a little candy not as much as he wants. Whoever told you to do that? But you told me to give him. Yeah, but I didn't tell you to just give him as much as he wants. So when we go upstairs, Hashem, I see that what you gave me ruined my life. Why did you give it to me when you knew this would ruin my life? So what would the bed in Shema say, Hashem? You know, <laughs> why did you do this? So Hashem says, do me a favor, don't ask. <laughs> right? Don't ask, because I know what's good for you and what's not good for you. So we, we can pray, Hashem, you know what's good for me. Give me what I need. What I need? Oh, that's completely different. Even though the, the Orachim did not mention it, I would also add another very important condition. He doesn't talk about it because obviously he's talking about an individual's prayer. But in general, uh, and another important condition for a prayer to be strong is tefillah betzibur versus tefillah beyachid. When you pray betzibur with a minyan, it has much more koach than praying by yourself at home. Sometimes we pray at home, what can we do? We, we miss the minyan, we're, we're, or we're on vacation somewhere, there's no minyan. It happens, it can happen. It's acceptable. The only difference is that tefillah minyan, even if you don't have that much kavana and focus on every word, the koach of the tzibur is powerful. The tzibur is very strong. The tzibur elevates all the tefillot in the room. When you're praying by yourself at home, you need a lot more kavana for that prayer to be equivalent to the tefillah of tzibur. It could be equivalent, but it needs much more come out. You have to pay attention to every word. We, we, we do not always do that, unfortunately. We're either in a rush, or we don't understand, or we're tired, or whatever. We can't even. So here, you want the tefillah be yahid by yourself to be accepted like the tefillah be sibur. It requires so much more kavana. So he tells us, make sure you take advantage. Take advantage of prayer. Do it right, because Hanum Rahumu, you know what that means? Hanum Rahumu, the Kadosh Baruch Hu is compassionate and merciful. It means that even if there's a terrible decree, the Kadosh Baruch Hu cancels decrees. In other words, we, the Jewish people, have the ability to cancel decrees, to cancel a bad mazal or change it if necessary. If sometimes it's not possible, but sometimes it is, through Teshuvah, Tefillah, Tzedakah, repentance, prayer, and charity. These are powerful tools to break down the, the door and to have and to allow our prayers to go in and uh, for Hashem to see that we've changed that he should cancel the bad decree he should change the mazal now mazal is not a decree mazal is something that we're born with and there may be a need of a good reason there's always a good reason but a reason for that mazal to stay with us for the rest of our lives but there are other times when Hashem says you've changed so much you've prayed so much you've had enough of this terrible kind of life 
from now on, from age 40 and on, till the rest of your life, I'll change your mazal. Or you haven't had children for 22 years, now you will have, even though you're not supposed to have. So one should always try. But always have in mind that Hashem knows what's best for us. So even if the prayer did not go through, and the prayer was done with tears, and it was, it was done correctly, and it was done with brachot of tzaddikim, and maybe Hashem says, listen, this is what's best for you, this kind of mazal. But whenever we're talking about a decree, a decree is something that we're not born with. A decree is something that can happen at any age, at any stage of life, or something terrible that was done or committed, either through the community, right, or through the individual. So people suffer the consequences of the community too. We live in the same community. Am Yisrael is all responsible for each other. For each other, the Holocaust. Even kids, a million children lost their life, were killed because of the. It's a it's 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 a collective punishment. But I never like to use the word punishment because in the end, this is a tikkun. Hashem loves us. Punishment is not the right word. It's a tikkun. It's an atonement to rectify something that was done wrong in order that we should have the Haile Kuram Abba, a share to the world to come, in order that we should go directly to Gan Eden. We, Hashem wants us to enjoy everything that He has to give us. But if we made mistakes, they have to be rectified. This, this is a world where there's, two, where there's a system of rectification. What can we do? But sometimes, by prayer, and by cha charity, and by, and by, of course, repentance, that makes a tremendous difference in that the Shemayim says, no more need for this Gezera, for this terrible decree to rectify. They've done it already on their own. Hashem would rather us do it than midat adin, than their attribute of justice should do it. So therefore, He gives us the chance, and this works much more with gezerot, with decrees, than it works with mazal. But it can also work with mazal. So we should never desist. We should never desist from trying, because as long as we know, we understand that Hashem always cares about us and does what's best for us, perhaps He will change our mazal. Perhaps he will cancel the queue. So we have to try. Yes? You mentioned four methods of praying. Shouldn't yeah. there be five with tears? Because the gate of tears is, is, is never closed. So no, not everybody, not everybody can shed tears so easily. So even though you are right, the gates of tears are not closed. Ever since the destruction of the Bait Shani, the second temple, where rabbis tell us the gates of prayer are closed, which means prayers don't go automatically. They are stopped and it criticized, and looked at by the Malachim, and they just don't go so easily through. Sometimes they let them through, but the gates are closed, meaning that it's harder to get through to penetrate. Tears, however, have never been closed. Somebody who sheds tears, the tears go direct. Tears of, the, of especially prayers of the orphans and widows, which Hashem is sensitive to, is also, you know, the, their prayers are heard. So there are exceptions. In other words, Hashem, of course, sees that the person is sincere, that the person is heartbroken, he's righteous and, he, and he's really, you know, doing his best to, to, to rectify his, his ma'asim. Hashem sees all of that. And of course, he takes that all into consideration. So tears is definitely a powerful tool, but it's not, necess it's not a, 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 that without tears, your prayer will never get through. No, no, I mean? but it's, it's almost a, a failsafe that it will get through. Yeah. So shouldn't they include it as one of the in addition to the other four? Not as a, con not as a condition, because what you, what you want to do is like this. You have a good point. You're saying, what, you know, if a person it, it cries, then he has a better chance. Yes, I even have a better idea for you. Something that is more powerful than tears, which most people don't know about. And that is, Rabbis tell us whenever a person is besakana, he's in danger. Danger does not necessarily mean that his boat is capsizing and he's about to drown. That's one kind of danger. Another kind of danger means that he's about to lose everything. Okay? He's about to lose everything financially. Or very, very ill, dying of cancer, chas v'shalom. All of these are called, let's call them all, it's not sakana, sakana means danger. Let's call them critical, very critical. Rabbis suggest that commit, one should commit himself to something. Hashem, I promise you, that if you get me out of this ordeal, ordeal, ordeal meaning whatever, sickness, problems, right? If you get me out of this, Hashem, I will do this and this and this. And that promise or commitment is significant. It's not like I'm going to give $18 to tzedakah. No. Hashem doesn't need our $18. He said, I take upon myself that I will never miss Tfilah B'Tzibur, as much as I can. Whenever I can, I will meet the Betakneset. Or, 
that I will begin to give ma'asir, which I never did. Something significant that he should do or and has not been doing. I will make sure that uh, that every poor man that comes to town has a place to stay. Because let's say he's the gabai, he's somebody that can that should handle these things. You know, this is a beautiful thing, a beautiful commitment, and uh, this may save his life. This may actually make a big, big difference. So it's good you, you it's good you raise that point with tears. But what what I would say is that it's not a prerequisite. It's more of a more of a guarantee. You're right. But it but make be, it a part of the. No, it's not a condition. He Why was telling us the, he was telling us conditions, prerequisites. The Orachayim was more talking about in his eyes. In other words, he says these are four almost prerequisites that without them it may not fly. But then you, what you were saying does not even need a time. Because if a person at, the, at this moment, well, no, not at this moment, at night, but just sits down and talks to Hashem in his own words, and it's not even a time of tefillah, and begins to cry to Hashem, and he says words on his own, that without the time, without the tefillah, without, that itself may do it. So tears is another form of prayer, is another form of communication. Now, of course, I agree with, I agree 100% that besides this four, if you also add tears to it, and you add a commitment, woo, you know, your chances grow. Definitely your chances grow. But it's not a prerequisite. No. Most people are not crying every day. When do they cry when things really hurt? <laughs> then they cry. They should cry occasionally. Rosh Hashanah in Kippur, you'll see more people crying because they're begging for their life. They're begging for Shana Tova. Right? So yes, crying is definitely a, as long as it's not cockadrile. Uh, alligator tears? Like Cocodrile. Cocodrile. No, alligator tears, yeah. As long as it's true tears that stem from the heart, it makes a difference. It does, it definitely does. All right, let's go on. Then he adds, to finish up his advice, a very important idea. Don't consider yourself a rasha. Why would somebody consider himself a rasha? A rasha means a wicked person, one who has only done, committed sins and not been civil. He says, don't think of yourself as a rasha. It is very possible that some people may lose hope. They may say, well, I don't have anything to gain from prayer anyway. Hashem doesn't like me. You know, chas v'shalom. The, 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 the individual has done almost everything in the books. Or even, not everything, but some terrible things. And he might say, you know what, I'm a lost case. Never look yourself at that, never think of yourself like that. A person may easily give up hope if he, if he has that attitude. And who's giving him those thoughts in his mind? The Yetzirah, and the Chasikui. You have no chance. After all, you know what you did. You did some terrible things. No, never think of yourself as a Rasha. So he's, he's warning us and advising us, be careful from this kind of an attitude. In the end, a person may lose hope even when it comes to prayer. I'll give you an example. There was once an individual that came to the Chafetz Chaim, Rabbi, Rabbi Yitzhak is, is grabbing all my tefillot, all my kavanot. He doesn't let me pray. Every time I begin to pray, pray I want to do a good job, I start thinking about my business. I'm in, in the middle, I'm in Hong Kong, <laughs> I'm in New York, I'm on this. I'm thinking about business. The Yitzhak is grabbing every, every kavanah. What should I do? He says, you know, don't be misled by this, that the Yetzirah gives you no chance. It's true. Yetzirah defeats us many times. We fall, we make mistakes. He grabs many times our kavanot and our filot. But let me give you a beautiful mashal. There was once an individual who was selling bagels. His wife sent him to sell, to sell bagels. The Russian army is coming to town. They're going to be very hungry. They're going to buy a lot of bagels. So instead of them coming to buy bagels, what instead happened is that they grabbed and they stole all his bagels. They didn't pay him. So he was left without a bagel and without money. He comes home, tells his wife. His wife doesn't say anything to him. Later on, he asks for some dinner. Now she begins to yell at him. Why are you yelling at me? He says, you don't understand. The fact that they grabbed your bagels, I'm not upset at you. But when you saw that everybody is grabbing, you should have grabbed two bagels for yourself. You would have had some dinner at least. 
You see everybody grabbing, you grab two. The Yitzhara grabs, you grab one tefillah. Okay, what can you do? You can't win. You can't win all the time. Everything. So one tefillah. Choose whichever you want. Alev lo l'shabeach. Yeah. Which is very important to have Kavana. Shema Yisrael. The Brachot in the morning. Something. Grab whatever you can. Of course, as much as you can. But grab. Because Yisra is grabbing. It's true. So you grab too. So don't let the, don't let the Yisra fool you. You can't. You're losing. You're a Rasha. You can't handle it anymore. No, 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 no. no. The Yetzirah is very, very easy in convincing the following. I've heard this personally from someone who told me, after I asked him, why don't you put on tzitzit? It's so cheap to buy a pair of tzitzit. Seven bucks, you can have a good tzitzit. I said, Rabbi, how could I buy tzitzit? How could I wear tzitzit if I don't eat kosher sometimes? Or if I do certain terrible averot? I'm ashamed. I should put on tzitzit. I said, you see, that's the Yetzirah telling you. What does one thing have to do with the other? Where does it say in the Torah, that if you do this sin, for whatever reason, you can't do this mitzvah. What does it say that? The Yetzirah makes you believe you are Rasha. Rasha. How could you put on Sisi? You're going to be a hypocrite? No, you're not going to be a hypocrite. You're doing your best. You're doing what you can. Just because you, you, you fall. This man has a weakness. And he had some weaknesses. Just because of that, you shouldn't put on Sisi. Tzitzit, which is a protection, which is such a big mitzvah that we have no idea. And it's so easy, nobody even sees it. What's the excuse? The excuse is that the Yetzirah are telling him, you are a shah, you can't put on tzitzit, you see? So I told him, I don't know what he's doing today, but I told him that this is, you know, not an excuse. So no one should ever give up. Even though he's committed all kinds of things, he should never give up and thinking, I have no chance. Don't have this attitude, therefore, of considering yourself a rasha. It happens occasionally, you ask somebody, do you put on tefillin? Right? An example. And he says, no. Or he may say worse, I don't believe in this. Right? The only thing you can do at that moment, immediately, which may help him, is tell him, don't say no. Just say not yet. It's a much better answer than saying no. Because when a person answers no, it does something to him too. It's like a, a mechanism of sorts that, I don't want to know. I don't want to have anything to do with it. No, I've made up my mind. Don't ever say that. Okay, you don't do it for whatever reason. We're not going to judge you for it. Instead, say, not yet. Because when you say not yet, maybe one day you will fulfill it. Beautiful, isn't it? Makes sense. You'll be surprised how many people will say, oh, you're right, not yet. They'll correct themselves. You may have some real uh, tough guys who says, no, I don't plan on it. Chaz shalom. I don't think there are too many of those. But we've got to correct the attitude. The attitude is very important because it affects us. We believe ourselves. If we say, not yet, we say, okay, maybe one day I will do it. So in other words, I'm not opposed to it. Very careful also not, a person should not call himself by any kinuim, any names. Oh, I'm a modern Jew. Don't, don't use names. Name, I'm against all kinds of names. He's a conservadox. Have you ever heard of that? <laughs> all kinds of, trying to see where a person fits in. I understand why people say that. They're trying to for shituchim purposes or for some other reason, that they have to be more specific where they're holding. But it's not right, because when a person really thinks of himself in a certain way, that's the way he'll continue to think of himself, and he won't want to change that. He, he's comfortable with that. A title is, is something that people attach themselves to. So don't give yourself a title. Say, Baruch Hashem, I'm observant. I'm not as observant or as strict uh, you know, as I can be or as others are. But this is how I was raised, you know, hopefully one day I'll become stricter, more careful, more observant. It's better that way, because again, we're talking about attitude. And attitude is, 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 is very, very critical. A person who thinks of himself as a rasha will also lose out that because of the way he thinks of himself, he won't want to pray to Hashem, he says, Hashem won't listen to me anyway. And that's not true either. Even though 
Yes, Hashem does not listen to the praise of Rishayim, but if a person still believes that he has a chance, even though he was wrong, you know, he was wrong in, in, in doing what he did, but he tries to pray. Hashem says, you know what, I'm going to help you find your way. But if he's at a Shavif Ne'as Mori, he may, he may come to think that his prayer will not help him. That's why you have to be careful. Yes, it's true. I made this mistake. I did this thing. I committed this wrong. But Hashem listens anyway. Hashem will listen to my prayer. I'm going to try anyway my best. So that then he has a chance. A person who, who thinks he's, a, he's, a, he's, a, he's, a, he's lost, then he won't pray. He won't even try to pray. And the Rambam goes, takes this one step further. The Rambam says when a person thinks of himself as a rasha, he won't even make any effort letaken et atzmo. He won't even make any effort to fix himself, his midot, his, his maasim, his deeds. It's a lost case, you know, forget it. You know, he won't even try. That's terrible. When a person doesn't even try, that's no good. So it's very, very serious. Very, very serious and very, very... very negative of a person to think of himself in such a way that he, you know, he has no chance. He, he, he can easily come to Yehush. Yehush means to, to, to despair. I've heard people saying, oh, I'm too old for changing. Change? Well, what's the big deal? To change your kitchen that was taref now, to make it kosher, not that, that much effort is involved. You gotta change the dishes, you gotta make the oven kasher and the sink, the stove, and that's it, you know. Just learn the halacho, be careful. What's the mean I'm too old for this? See, this is a little bit of that too. Or that it's too difficult to change, too old, too late. No good. Wrong. Very unhealthy to think that way. Okay, next Mishnah. We'll just, do, we'll just do one more Mishnah and leave the last two for next week. By the way, next week, I have a doubt. I'll let you know if it'll be a show or not. I'm not sure. It could be, it could be now. We won't know until the uh, beginning of next week. Rabbi Azar Omer, When it comes to learning Torah, Mishakud. What's Shakud? I guess we could translate it diligent. Even though shakud means more than diligence, it means to, it means immersion. I think it means that a person should be prepared to immerse himself, to involve himself on a very deep level with Torah, not just superficially. And this statement is really related to the next one. In other words, he, he, even though it's a separate, the next statement is a separate statement, but I think that they're, they're combined. Why would somebody need immersion? Immersion means to immerse yourself, to, to go deeper than just the surface of knowing the basics. No, shakudli motoramo. Because you may have to deal with atheists. You may have to deal with non-believers. So that you should know what to answer a heretic. Heretic is a picoroso or an atheist, somebody who doesn't believe. Now, the commentaries do tell us you don't want to get involved in an argument with a non believer, especially a Jew. If he doesn't believe, forget it, leave him alone. Because he's already made up his mind that he doesn't want to believe. He's not an agnostic, he's a kofer. Don't leave him alone because you won't change his mind so easily. He's already made up his mind. Here we're talking about that you're confronted by Goyim, you're having this argument, they're trying to dissuade you uh, from doing uh, what you're doing, you know, it's from, from being Jewish, they're trying to mislead you, I should say. And uh, you have to be, one has to be prepared to defend the Torah, to defend himself. The Jew should be proud of who he is, should have some clarity as to why he does certain things, as much as possible, of course, everyone according to his level. But a person who's learned in Torah, especially a learner, learner, we already spoke about the importance of learning Torah, but here he's telling us, this is Rabbi Azar, who was a ma'ayan, a novea, he's, a, he's, he's a, a wellspring of Torah, a fountain of Torah, always, you know, coming up with new ideas. Chidusheh Torah, 
very, very powerful. So he's telling us Torah cannot just be learned on the surface because we have many challenges in life for those other philosophies of life, other religions that confront us. And there is always a danger. There's a danger of a Jew becoming weakened in his resolve, in his commitment, in his beliefs. So if you are shakud, if you are, if you immerse yourself, you will not only learn a lot, you will also learn how to deal with people who uh, will antagonize you. In other words, will, will, go, will come against you, will try to oppose you. So the commentaries explain that we see from these words that from Torah, Torah alone, you are able to deal with these challenges that, that are presented by the Bikot. You don't have to learn the Quran. You don't have to learn the Christian Bible, even though some have done that, so they should be able to answer them from their sources. It's not necessary, it's not a necessity. Even though a lot of rabbis are great scientists or are very knowledgeable in science, it's a, it's a good thing to be knowledgeable in other areas. It's not a necessity of, the, of, 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 in other words, that one, without it, one does not have the answers. Because according to our tradition, the Torah has all the answers. In other words, if one is really diligent in the learning of Torah to its depths, one can have all the answers to all the questions out there. You don't have to have come to other sources, not non-Torah sources, to be able to answer these. From the Torah alone, if one is shakud, of course, which not everyone is, complete immersion in the Torah, like the Chazanish is known to have been able to to give advice on operations. He never went to college. When did he learn the anatomy of a human being? That he can tell the man, tell your surgeon where to cut on your skull, where to, where to make, how to remove the tumor from the brain. How will he, how will he, he says, I know this all from Torah. How? Huh? Yes, everything is in the Torah. But it requires immersion. It requires Torah Nishma too, for the sake of heaven. Because when a person learns Torah for the sake of heaven, he it elevates him to tremendous heights and he's able to gain HaKodesh of course, divine inspiration he's able to gain a lot of knowledge so there's no doubt that one who is completely immersed in the Torah has so much has so much to offer that will come in handy especially in confronting all these atheists and skeptics and heretics If a person does not know, he should not argue with, with somebody like that because we don't want him to lose the fight because then he'll feel terrible and say maybe he's right, right? So if, if you don't know, don't, don't argue with him. What's very funny is that a lot of the Christians, especially Christians, have tried to uh, ask all kinds of questions uh, in, in an attempt to support their doctrine from our sources, from the Hebrew Bible, from the Torah. And they show you, it says virgin birth, as an example. If you look at the original, in the Shana Kodesh, it doesn't say virgin. It says Alma. Alma is a young maiden, a young, little, a young woman. What does that have to do with the Tula in Hebrew is virgin? So they translate in the wrong way because of course of their intentions they don't they're not sincere truthful in trying to figure out what the text says no they're trying to get it to work to satisfy their doctrine so the rabbis tell us i think it's in the midrash that whenever you have a an unusual uh, text that can be misunderstood one of those texts that can be misunderstood, which can pose a problem to one who's not strong in Emunah, and they use it, and they, in the Goyim, or the heretics, may want to use it as, as an example. Don't forget to look at the entire context. Look at the Pesukim before, and look at the Pesukim afterwards. Ki ha munah because the answer to their question and to their doubt and to their proposition will always be close nearby. Always. In other words, oh, look at this. It says this, 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 this. Wait, wait, wait a minute. Let me read the whole 
Perek. Let me read all the Pesukim before and after. What are you talking about? This is talking about something completely different. This is not talking about this, it's talking about that. So you see, for that a person has to be learned. For that a person has to be ready. Right? One has to be prepared to defend his Torah, to defend his people. And even though I, don't, I, would, I would rather not use him as an example, but Ben Gurion, when he was at the United Nations, I believe, how did he defend that Israel belongs to the Jews? He took out a Bible, says even the Bible says so. Oh, all of a sudden you believe in the Bible? <laughs> yeah, when it serves him. Says the Bible says so. <laughs> the Bible says that Hashem gave us the land. What do you have to do with the Bible? He's not, he wasn't observant, he was secular completely. But to convince the world, and some of them are Christians, of course, when they know what a Bible is, he uses that book. Very nice of you that you're using our book, but how come you don't believe in the rest of the Bible, what the rest of the Bible says? Just this? <laughs> Go ask him. I think somebody did. <laughs> Anyway, it's important to be learned so that we know how to defend ourselves, to be proud of who we are, that what we have is the emet, the truth. As far as how to go about learning, there's a, very, there's a lot of questions about what to learn, how to learn. We won't get into all of that right now, but there was one interesting question that I saw that is very nice, uh, very befitting here. And that is a question that the Chafetz Chaim posed to Rabbi Israel Salam to Zechis Adi This This question must have happened, I don't know over 130 years ago, something like that, many, many years ago, when they met. Chafetz Chaim was obviously a young man then, younger, and he asked Rabbi Israel, he says, tell me, what's better, to learn a certain portion of the Torah well, deeply, and to, and to concentrate only on that area of Torah, or to have a broader understanding, even though it's not all deep, as deep, from a broader segment of Torah? Good question. You know, what should you, because how much can you learn? You know, so perhaps you should just concentrate on one area. No, oh, do well, 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 good, good, good. Then to cover a larger area and not know it as good. So Rabbi Salanta says a Jew should always strive to become knowledgeable in as much of, as possible of Hashem's Torah. To see how great and how beautiful the Torah is. In other words, there's so much to learn, so much to know. So a Jew should never limit himself to just one area of Torah. Obviously, there's some areas of Torah that we need to review more often. It's Halachot, Yilchot Shabbat, and so forth. There are certain things that one is more pulled towards, that he's going to be more successful in learning them. Yes, there are definitely certain parts of Torah that require more immersion, and more focus and so forth. Yeah, but in general, the idea should be that a Jew should never limit himself. A Jew should become as, as much as possible familiar with all aspects of Torah. The Kabbalah is a little bit of an exception because Kabbalah, there are certain areas of Alakha that are not, not for everyone to learn. But in general, a Jew should never limit himself just to this area. And unfortunately, this is a big problem today when a lot of kids and adults do not know enough Tanakh. Not, the girls sometimes know more than the boys. Then they, the Bachure Yeshiva, it's not right. right? Everybody should become as familiar as possible with every aspect of the Tanakh, Tefillah, Halacha, the basic Halachot. It's very, very important for everyone to know. So obviously, even though there are some advantages of, of learning certain things uh, on a deeper level, still, do not limit yourself to just one area of Torah. Learn as much as possible upon everything that there is. All right, next. After telling us, Habeshakulil Mot Torah, he tells us, Vedama Shetashiv Lavikoros. Obviously, one should always be prepared to give the answers to Apikorsi, to those who are not learned, to those who have doubts. But, it does not mean that everyone should try that. We said before that only one who is prepared to do that should argue, should teach, should clarify. But one should, if, one, if he's confronted by people who are at least somewhat eager to know, then he should be prepared. If, he do, if one does not know, if one does not know 
to give the proper answers and they should not deal with them. The last portion of the Mishnah goes as follows. Know before whom you are working. In other words, Abil Azar says, listen, you're going to be working very, very hard. You're going to be learning a lot of Torah. You're going to be learning a lot of Torah. You're going to be working very hard to observe Torah mitzvot. Right? Know before whom you are working. What, what, is, what is that all about? What's the significance of that? Rabbi Azar reminds us that our work before Hashem is not the same as work before other human beings. Let's say, for example, somebody was hired to do something. And he says, okay, for this, I charge $2,000 for this job. It ends up being that this job was much more complicated. It took more time. It was a lot harder. You think that the person who hired him is going to pay him more? No. This is what we made up. This is what I pay you. Hashem doesn't work like that. Hashem, as we will see later on, pays us according to our effort. Going to go hard, hard, how hard we worked how difficult it was. That's a, that's, a, that's a tremendous big difference than if a person just you know, works for an effort. There's no comparison. Working for Hashem is a completely different uh, system. So Rabbi Azar, of course, is encouraging us that don't, don't look at it as being so hard and work so, so much. And yes, but remember who you're doing this for. You're doing this for Hashem. And the rabbis tell us that one will be rewarded even for that which he didn't understand when he learned Torah. You learn Zohar, even if you don't understand all the words of the Zohar, you still get credit for it. When a Jew fulfills a mitzvah, even though he doesn't fully understand what he's doing, he still gets credit for it. Wow, what a system. You get credit even if you don't understand, even if you don't focus that much. Wow, yes. So remember, he says, yes, you may be working very hard, you may be learning a lot, you may not be understanding everything. But remember who you're doing this for. And you know what? Not only, not only are you working for Hashem, this boss, Hashem, you can trust him. He pays. He doesn't pay necessarily right now. That's why you have to trust him. He pays with a post-dated check. Right? Later on. But you can trust him. This is somewhere where your money is secure. No devaluation, no inflation, no junk bonds, right? No stocks. This reward is guaranteed. So Neiman who ba melachtecha, ba melachtecha, she shalem lechasechar kolotecha. You can trust him that whatever you did, every little bit will be accounted for. This is a very important point because there are people, it happens all the time in Yeshivot and elsewhere, there are people that fall into a mashber. A mashber, I think the best translation for it is a nervous breakdown. Okay? A nervous breakdown where, where people have lost hope, people think that there's no, it serves no purpose, they're working so hard, they don't see the results, whether it's not, not good results of their learning or, or they're still struggling in life, even though they're very observant and they do in spot. You know, they may, you know, this in Bachure Yeshiva, learning Yeshiva, they, working so hard, toiling 15, 16, 17 hours a day sometimes learning. And it becomes monotonous, it, it, it loses taste, what's going to happen, I'm not getting ahead, I'm not advancing, I don't know that much. Uh, time is going by, and, or it could be other pressures in life that are making them think like that. You know, the, the, the finances are no good, the family is no good, the slow bite is not right. And here they're working so hard, they're trying to be as, as good as possible, as best as possible, and they don't notice that what they're doing is making a difference. 
Rabbi Lazar says, what you do makes a tremendous difference. You have no idea. You're not just working for the bank. You're not working for, the, for, for Uncle Sam. You're not working even for yourself. You, you're working for Hashem. A, you're the servant of Hashem. So he's, he's infusing us with tremendous amount of encouragement that the main reward, you have no idea even what's waiting for you. Because this is a reward that you can trust that the Almighty will give you, not just anybody else. Now, the question is raised that what he's saying is reminding us about reward. But wait a minute, we've learned before that one should not work in anticipation of reward. It's true. One should not learn to be rewarded. As best as possible, one should learn Hashem Shemayim for the sake of heaven. One should do a mitzvah, for, not for us, for a gain. Yes, that's correct. We were taught that the ideal situation is not to do any mitzvah or learn any Torah for Sechah. And here he's putting an emphasis, trust him. One day he's going to pay you for it. Why? Learning can be very difficult. Yes, certain mitzvot can be challenging. To be a Jew is not difficult, even though some say it's difficult to be done. Obviously, if you're being persecuted, then you're having a hard time. It could be challenging. So yes, observant of certain mitzvot can be challenging under certain conditions, certain circumstances. Learning Torah can be very, very demanding. It requires commitment. It requires sometimes trying to figure out complex issues of halakha, depending on what you're learning. You lose sleep over it, so it's not easy. Challenging is a better word for it. Comes along Rabbi Lazar, who's a very much strong remembering the area of Torah, him and Rabbi Lazar, into the importance of learning Torah, despite the difficulty. Labrota Koshi says, You know what? You have no idea what's coming to you. You're working for Hashem. And Hashem's system accounts for every word. Every word that, that the Jew says in prayer, every word that the Jew learns in Torah, right? There's reward for that, for everything. So every, every word has value. So he's, he's giving us encouragement here. You think you just wasted? You're breaking your head in trying to understand something? You think that all of that, that effort is in vain? Every effort, every word that was said, everything is accounted for. Now, this Mishnah is uh, related a little bit to the next Mishnah, which we'll see another time. That, and that is that life is precious, time is precious, and life is short. That will be the next Mishnah. So he's reminding us here towards the end to be very, very careful, therefore, with the learning of Torah and the fulfillment of Mitzvot, because this is Melechet Shamayim. This is not the melacha, the work of a human being that you can, eh, you can get away with it, as we say in English. Sometimes do it right, not, doing, not, not be as, as devoted, not being as careful. You're painting. Okay, so I painted. I use spray paint instead of the brush. You know. This is melechet shalai. You will be rewarded accordingly. What does accordingly mean? Hashem pays overtime too. That's what. <laughs> in other words, here in this world, a lot of things don't go right. And people try to get by. Okay, but listen, here I want you to feel good about what you're doing. Hashem will even pay you overtime for every little word that you learned. Therefore, be careful, Loli Trashel, not to neglect it. This is Melechet Shammai. And finally, the, the reason why Rabbi Ezer puts so much emphasis on the learning of Torah in that you can trust Hashem and know before who you're learning is because this somewhat is related to the important principle. They remember the important principles, the 13 important principles, and one of them is Sachar Vahonish, there's reward and punishment. You remember that? One of the principles that Judaism very much believes in, there is such a thing as reward and punishment. And in the same way that we saw before, prayer is so important. Prayer basically reminds us, Hashem not only supervises this world, He actually listens to our prayer. Oh, He's so far away, He listens? Yes, that's something that not everybody understood and agreed and accepted. This is something that we believe very much strongly. Yes, He's there, He's everywhere, 
every word that we say is accounted for and documented and recorded, we, through our prayers, can reach Him. And therefore, this is also a very valuable point here. Not only through our prayer can we reach Him, but through our learning, nothing escapes Him. But all the sakhar that we're waiting for, that we need to trust Him. That you need to trust him because part of a principle of Sakhar Vaonish is that even though we don't see it in Olam Azeh, it's there in Olam Abba. Reward and punishment is a very important principle that we believe that one day it will be accounted for even though we don't see it right now. So th these words are extremely encouraging, especially when we don't see the, the effects of our actions. How are we being rewarded? No, 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 you're not just working for any one of you. This is Malech and Shammai. You're working for Hashem. And you can trust that the Sata Shem one day will come and Hashem will reward you for everyone. Thank you. Amen.